This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. And welcome in, folks, to another edition of Open Mic Night. I'm your host, Noah Taluki. And on today's episode, the Lions 16-16 to tie against Pittsburgh. I'll break that down for you and, and talk a little bit more uh, about some details from that and, and why I have a little bit of hope that the Lions will finally get at least a win, at least one win uh, this season, just just pending on just from the performance that they had against Pittsburgh uh, as well. Also, a really, really good friend of mine, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Kyle Kelly, will be joining us later. Uh, he has done some work with some Browns uh, websites before. He's a good friend of mine from John Carroll. He graduated with me last year, and uh, he's a, a student at Medill. And uh, Medill, which is the journalism school at Northwestern, it's the best in the country. And uh, he is one of the, uh, he's a student over there. They've had some alums like Rich Eisen and Adam Schefter uh, go through their, uh, their the program there at Medill. So I'm, re- I'm really happy uh, and excited to have him along. He also does some Ohio State recruiting for Cleveland.com. So uh, we're going to get a little bit of insight uh, with all of that later on. Uh, so I, I really hope that you guys uh, love the interview with Kyle. He's, uh, he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful guy. Like I said, one of my best friends. Spent so much time together, and uh, it's uh, always, always great to, to catch up with him, that's for sure. Hope everyone had a great weekend out there. I definitely did. Uh, the Lions, uh, we'll get to that in a moment, but I do want to give my John Carroll Blue Streaks uh, a big shout-out. Jackson Sartain, uh, one of our best uh, players of all time in, in John Carroll's 100th year, 100th year of uh, basketball, he uh, he actually set a uh, broke a 59 year old scoring record against uh, in the first game of the season for John Carroll. 55 points he scored. He made 15 threes. 15 threes. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Hey, maybe get him on the Pistons. The Pistons need some help uh, in the in that department. But uh, but I I digress. And our soccer team is going to the Sweet 16 in the NCAA tournament for the first time. Uh, in uh, since 2003, so uh, a lot to be proud of there, and you know it's just that's what it's like here at John Carroll. You guys hear me talk about John Carroll on the podcast. It's because we're just it's a big family over here, and 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 you know of course I work in the sports information department at John Carroll. I'm a, I'm a graduate assistant there, and uh, you know we have a lot of pride for for our teams at John Carroll. So if you're new to the podcast, thank you for listening as always, and uh, just know I'll be talking about John Carroll uh, on some podcasts because of uh, how wonderful a, a great university it is over in Cleveland. But hey. I bleed Honolulu blue and silver, though. I'm still I'm still a Detroit sports fan. I I, I have not been converted to any sort of Cleveland professional teams. Uh, I do not like the Browns. Just just putting it out there. And uh, of course, I would be at the game this weekend in Cleveland if I uh, if I did not have uh, prior commitments. Uh, same with Pittsburgh. I would have been at that game if I didn't have to work our our soccer game uh, on on Sunday. But I uh, you know. I'm, maybe I'm kind of happy I didn't go to the game, at least because I, I would have been poured on in the second half. But it would at least have been cool to, to witness uh, Detroit's first uh, tie, I guess, uh, our first non-loss, if you will, of the season. But uh, I, it's look, we've talked about it on the podcast just how dreadful this offense has been. I mean, Jared Goff continuing to not impress. 14 of 25 for 114 yards, no touchdowns, sacked four times. Quarterback rating of sixty seven point eight. Just, I don't, I don't know what else to say, guys. I mean, he he is just not good when he doesn't have talent around him and when he doesn't have scheme. I mean, there's you can't expect much. However, it's surprising that Detroit even stayed in this game. I mean, they ran, they were running the football well. This is this was one of their best rushing performances at least in the last couple years as a team. I mean, they ran for two hundred twenty nine yards. And two touchdowns. DeAndre Swift with 130 of those yards, his second career, 100 uh, yard game. Uh, so the one, the other one was against Jacksonville last year. So uh, you know Detroit ran the ball well. I mean against a, a Pittsburgh defense that's that's pretty solid. I mean they're, they're, this is not a bad defense that they have. But uh, you know Ben Roethlisberger the day before put on uh, the COVID list. So Matt or Mason Rudolph had to start, and uh, you know it was not it wasn't that pretty for for Mason Rudolph of course. Uh, you know, a lot of turnovers as well. You know, the, I know uh, Detroit had that interception. Julian O'Quara, by the way, making a nice play on defense. Um, great play. I mean, they basically lined him up in the gap, uh, you know, near the center. And he peeled out. He was that athletic enough to peel out that far into the flat and pick that pass off. I mean, that that was that was a pretty good defensive play call by Aaron Glenn. But this defense is so streaky. There's weeks that they show up. Overall, I thought the defense played well. And I understand you guys are going to say it was against the Pittsburgh backups, but it's the NFL. You have to adjust, and, and you have to play who you're who you're facing. So, 
you know, you know there's there's no ifs and or, ands or buts about it. You got to play who you're who you're out there against. And I thought overall, the defense, you know, they played well. I mean, did they get any sacks? No, any pressure? Not really. But the defensive backfield played well, and it was you know it was rainy conditions, and uh, you know they they held up overall. But like I said, the offense, especially especially throwing the football, has has, has done nothing. I mean, Amon Ross St. Brown led the way, four receptions, sixty-one yards. I mean, these guys, and, and then the other, the other big thing was T.J. Hawkinson. You know, he had one target all game, zero receptions, only one target. I mean, this is a guy that everyone hypes up about that he's a top five tight end in the NFL. I think if he's a top five tight end in the NFL, you should be getting him the ball more uh, than just one target in a game that ended in a tie. So you had an extra period in there for overtime as well. And I, look, I understand TJ's going to be getting double teamed, but you know, guys, you, you spent a top ten pick on him a couple years ago, and I understand this isn't the regime's fault. That this was not the regime's pick, but he's got to produce more. You, you better be feeding the ball top ten. And I understand, you know, obviously the the, the ground game was uh, pretty evident. You know, TJ was out there more to block uh, than than pass. But you got to get this guy a ball if you want to get the chance. If you want to have a chance in these games, you got to get him the ball. I just I don't understand, and I thought it was interesting too with Dan Campbell calling the plays. Very interesting, deciding to shake things up a little bit after the bye, and it was very evident that he was calling the plays because Anthony Lynn in the press box, as they showed on the broadcast, did not have a headset on, and on top of that, you could see that Dan Campbell had the play call sheet and he was switching back and forth between Golf and some of the other coaches on his uh, radio receiver. So, you know. I, I appreciate Detroit trying to change things up uh, with, you know, play calls and, and just trying to trying to get some sort of juice. I, I get that, uh, but you know, running the ball thirty nine times in, in, in the game, and I understand the conditions were tough and everything, but you know, that's that's Dan Campbell's brand of football. I could just tell he he just wants to run that football, but uh, you know, that's what happens when you have Jared Goff as your quarterback. You can't really do much. I mean, this was what was limiting Sean McVay in the offense in 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 L A. You know, and it's very evident. It's very evident with Detroit. We'll talk. We'll talk a little bit more with Kyle about some of that, some of the quarterback problems, and and maybe a little bit of the draft uh, as well, as well as the game, the the Browns and the Lions, because he's you know he he's known about the Browns and, and covered the Browns for a long time. But uh, like I said, overall, not a bad defensive effort for the Lions. But uh, you know, it's just it's just tough to watch sometimes. It's tough to watch out there when the defense is playing so hard. And they forced a turnover like they did with Julian O'Quara. And to see the offense just fall flat, calling these screen plays. I don't know how many screens the Lions ran, but man, I'm like, so why would you run like a draw on a third and 12? Why would you? You got to get, what, what happened to Dan Campbell being aggressive? You know, I, I don't. I just don't get it. Why, you know, you, you had all, some of these aggressiveness early on in the season. Where was that? Not much aggressiveness there. But, hey, I give credit to Detroit and the defense. They stepped up. You know, that first drive was a little scary because I thought, well, it was just so easy, Mason Rudolph going up against, you know, James Washington through that touchdown. And I just thought, oh, here we go again. But, uh, you know, it's, oh, my gosh, this the, this game, it just, gives, it just gives me headaches sometimes. Of course, of course, the Lions tie. But, I mean, this is a place they haven't won since 1955. I don't know they're playing against backups, but still. Uh, offense, basically, bottom line, offense needs to get better. Defense, defense is playing well. They just need to keep playing like that and give offense more chances. You know, and hopefully, like one something cracks. Uh, you know, DeAndre Swift is obviously a stud. Um, you know, but we, they just they just got to get him get him the ball more. And let's 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 see what happens. So it'll be a tough test against Cleveland. I know Miles Garrett, you know, one of the best defensive ends in the league. We'll see if we'll see how that offensive line holds up. By the way, speaking of offensive line, Taylor Decker was back at left tackle for this game, first game all season. He uh, complained a little bit to the media about his his uh, presence and a lot of BS about him. I don't Taylor. I got to admit, I don't know a lot of BS that's happened about you. I don't know. Are people really questioning your toughness? I'm I'm not sure. I I, I don't know. I don't know what your beef is right now, Taylor, but. I uh, I thought that was kind of interesting how he went off with the media about his, you know, his image for this this season. But regardless, Taylor Decker's back, and uh, they moved Panay Sewell over to right tackle, and uh, actually graded out pretty good according to a PFF. 
So uh, that that's that's a that's a good sign, uh, for sure. But tough task against Cleveland. Uh, you know, Baker Mayfield is is battered uh, and beaten. You know, kind of like uh, one of our old guys, Matthew Stafford. <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, be surprised if Baker's out there uh, playing on uh, this this Sunday. But it should be fun. It's always uh, it's always good when the Lions play the Browns, at least for me, because you know I'm a I'm a very diehard Detroit Lions fan over here, and you know seeing um you know seeing the seeing the the Brown the the brown and orange over here is uh you know i see it so much and those diehard browns fans i mean they're they're a different breed of fans for sure this the whole northeast ohio is just so different than than football in michigan that's for sure but uh just to, you know just to see and i'm sure there'll be a lot of lions fans at that game as well uh right on the lake over there at uh, first energy stadium but it's uh it should be it should be exciting and uh that'll be fun uh, that's for sure. All right, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time talking. I wanted to get to the interview with uh, with Kyle, so uh, it'll it'll uh, it was definitely a great interview, and it was really really great catching up with him. So here's uh, here's my interview with uh, my good friend Kyle Kelly. And joining us now here on the Open Mic Night podcast is a very special guest, one of my best friends from John Carroll University, and uh, a guy who is uh, doing a lot of great things now. Uh, a student at Medill, the number one journalism school in the country. Also doing some stuff for Ohio State recruiting for Cleveland.com. Mr. Kyle Kelly. Kyle, it's so good to see you finally. I, I feel like I haven't seen you in months. Oh, let's relax. Are you going to tell your listeners that we talked on the phone for almost three hours over the weekend? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Hey, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we, we uh, three hours. We, we just cannot stop talking some days. But I haven't seen you face to face since we're, we're doing this uh, the Zoom call interview here, but hey, like, how have you been? I just, I, I feel like I, we, we just, we just need to catch up a little bit more, even even after three hours. But you know, how have you been? How, how you like in Chicago too? You know, it's it's been a couple months, your first couple months there. Well, Noah, um, I, one of my first trips to Rogers Park, I got off the bus uh, at Loyola University, and I, I saw your sister Gracie. She was the first first person I saw, so that was kind of interesting, but. Um, overall, Chicago has been great. I, I didn't really have much of a, an expectation, I guess, really coming here. So, uh, when I, I, I think that honestly is what has made it so great. I didn't have any expectations. I didn't really know what to make of it. Um, obviously I lived in Cleveland for four years, graduating from John Carroll university. Uh, I'm familiar with living on my own and being on my own. Um, but this was a little bit of a new animal where I was going somewhere where I knew complete, completely no one, at least, um, on the school level, I, I know some people here, of course, Sam Bornhorse, Noah, who, you know, uh, from John Carroll, we broadcasted with. So I knew him here and a couple others from Toledo, my hometown, but, uh, in terms of knowing people in school, I, I didn't know anyone, so that was a little bit of a change. But uh, I, I think it's it's been a lot of fun. I will say, believe it or not, the weather is colder here than in Cleveland or in Detroit or Toledo, for that matter. Uh, well, you're probably used to getting the 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 weather off the the lake or you know the river, being that you live in Grove Steel. But I will say, being right here off Lake Michigan, um, I mean, I have certainly learned why they call it the Windy City. Oh, I'm oh, I'm sure, especially especially probably now it's it's probably it's probably getting a lot getting a lot colder. I know I know back in Detroit it's it's getting a little colder uh, as well just before uh, just before a wonderful Thanksgiving. But I want to ask you. So I mentioned before that you are a student at Medill, the number one journalism school in the country. It's it's on it's part of Northwestern, and uh, you know you were one of only a handful of students in the entire country to get into the one year program. You know how how has it been like at Medill? Because you know people from Medill have gone on to do amazing things. I mean, most notably like, you know, Adam Schefter or uh, Rich Eisen. I mean, those are some of the most famous alums among so many others in sports media. You know, what's your experience been like and, and how cool is it to, to be in Chicago with all these wonderful other people that have the same interests as you? So I will say I, w- I was not one of a handful. Don't, don't act like I'm that much big time. I, in my specialization, which is sports media, I'm one of 32, and then we have about 150 to 160 people in our program. So it is a, a decent sized program, one year masters, and I think that's what makes it unique. Um, a lot of these masters programs are two years. Um, and the other thing about Medell that I really don't think that you can find anywhere else, unless 
maybe you go to USC or Columbia, but to my knowledge, those two schools don't have specializations in sports media. Um, but Medell is located in Chicago, which is the third biggest market in the United States in terms of television news. Um, basically the third biggest city here as well. So it, I, I think being right in the heart of downtown Chicago just gives so much, so many opportunities. And I think that's what Northwestern does so well is really using that to their advantage. I, I know that within the last five years, they actually moved, I believe, from Evanston to downtown Chicago, at least the, the graduate program for Medell. Now, the undergrads still are in Evanston, which is the main campus of Northwestern University. Uh, but we're right in the heart of downtown. We go downtown every single day, and there's just a lot of opportunity down there um, for stories, getting to know people, networking. It's, and I think that the, one of the other things that I – that I think is unique when going to Medell is it's on the 16th floor of this random building on East Wacker drive in Chicago, right along the Chicago river. Um, and there's a, a sense of professionalism expected. I mean, you, when you, it, it's like, you know, going to work, essentially, they, they keep the office open from nine to five. Uh, you're expected to be on time. You're expected to dress appropriately. You're, appropriately or expected to behave professionally. It's not like, you know, an undergrad classroom where, you know, sometimes people just roll out of their dorm room and, and go to class. Um, you know, we're, we're actually in a building, like, you know, we're working somewhere. So I think that for someone like me, I mean, I've worked a nine to five before, but I think this is a little bit more, um, uh, the expectations here are, are uh, much greater, like, you, you know, you're expected to, you know, be professional and act like you're, you're in the industry. So I, I think, you know, overall it is, um, it's really it, being here for, you know, two months or whatever it's been, I've really seen why it's one of the top journalism schools in the country. The professors here are great. They give a lot of feedback. Um, but you know, like anything, it's it's what you make of it. And I think that there's just a, an abundant amount of resources that Medell gives. And, you know, being in the sh city of Chicago certainly has them as well. So I mentioned a little bit earlier as well, you know, you, you just have so much a, a wealth of experience uh, in covering all kinds of different sports. You know, not only at John Carroll, but through Cleveland.com, the News Herald, which is the local newspaper uh, on the east side of Cleveland, you know, you have all this. You have all this experience, and you also had some experience early on uh, with the Cleveland Browns. And you, you have an interesting story. You mentioned you're from Toledo, student, at, uh, graduate of St. John's Jesuit High School. You know, how did you get your start with all the Brown stuff? Because it's, a, I think, it's a very interesting story. So I would not be in sports media today if it wasn't for the Cleveland Browns. And um, my sophomore year of high school, that's when I really kind of dove into my Browns fandom. I would say I would be. Before then, I was more so of a casual fan. I'd catch most of the games. Um, I certainly, you know, followed the team uh, closely. But, you know, I also was a fan of the Detroit Tigers, Detroit Red Wings, um, Cleveland Cavaliers, Notre Dame Irish, uh, Fighting Irish football. And, you know, the Browns was kind of on the same level as all of those teams. But my sophomore year, I, I really became like a diehard fan. There was just something about the, the NFL that really attracted me. So I had a uh, personal Twitter, um, like, you know, so many high school students do, and I would tweet about the Cleveland Browns on Sundays. And I had noticed that some of my friends were unfollowing me because I was spamming their timelines. So I was like, okay, I don't want people to unfollow me. So what I did is I created a Cleveland Browns fan page account. And over the course of, you know, a couple of years, it ended up blowing up to nearly 8,000 followers. Um, and as a result of that, I started doing some writing for some Cleveland Browns sports blogs. Um, it got to a point where I was recognizable enough where I did interviews um, for a couple of radio stations that wanted me to talk about the Browns. And I was essentially a Browns beat reporter in high school. 
uh, with the coverage that I provided. Now, it, if there's one thing I didn't really understand in high school and um, even early on in college was the actual journalism part of being on a beat, which is what I'm learning here, um, and the importance of actual journalistic reporting. A lot, a lot of my tweets and writing during high school, and I mean, it makes sense because I was in high school, was kind of like your typical fan analysis. Um, you know, it's it wasn't really uh, unbiased coverage. It was a it was a lot of bias, but you know. I think because of that, I connected with Browns fans, which allowed me to have the type of success that I did covering the Browns. And being in that atmosphere and also loving the Browns and becoming a diehard fan during that time, I would listen to Cleveland Sports Radio around the clock. I would live on Twitter. I uh, was reading a lot of articles, and that's really where I found my passion for sports media. Going back to when I was in grade school, I would, when I came home from school, I don't know why, but I would always turn on the local news. For some reason, I always thought about what would it be like for me to be on the television and be a reporter. At night, I would listen to local radio stations. In the morning, I would listen to local radio shows. I would listen to Mike and Mike. And looking back on it, now it all makes sense. I did have a passion for communication and media back then. And then covering the Browns is what really helped me find that passion and then, of course going to John Carroll as you know know our mentor Chris Wensler he took that to a an entire new level um but for someone that grew up their entire life playing sports and loved sports and then at one point as you know um and I, I think that it's a, this way for a lot of people there comes in a time in your life where you no longer are capable athletically to continue at the next level and when I was done playing sports in high school, I had to find another passion. And luckily, it still involves sports, except it was communication this time around. Well, I mean, very similar to when I would read the newspapers back in the day in the, in the sports section with, uh, you know, Detroit fans. You know Dave Burkett, obviously, we've had him on the podcast before. Mike Wojnowski, listen to Mike Valeni on the radio. Very similar. This this is this is why we're this is why we're best friends, folks, and uh, this is why Kyle is uh, talking some Browns with us. We'll we'll actually get to some more Browns coverage a little bit later on in the interview. But I, I talked about it in the beginning as well about Ohio State, and uh, you know Kyle has a nice little gig with uh, Cleveland dot com doing some reporting for uh, Ohio State football recruiting. And I just want to ask, you know, because you're texting me all the time about some Ohio State recruits from Michigan that are on a that are on the Buckeyes radar. One guy in particular. Dante Moore, the quarterback from uh, Detroit King High School, you know, a, a historically great program, especially in the last 10 years uh, in the MHSAA. You know, what about Dante? What makes Dante Moore so special? And, and how come he's being coveted, you know, by Ohio, Ohio State? So I haven't gotten the opportunity to watch Dante Moore play, but just knowing what I know about him is. You know, he's a guy, he's a junior, um, he's 6'2", 195 pounds. Um, he's an incredible athlete. Uh, and because of his size and his athleticism at this age, now 6'2", you probably want him to be a couple inches taller. But I know he's drawn a lot of attraction from a lot of the Power 5 schools and top Power 5 schools. He's rated as a five-star under the – uh, 247 sports composite which the composite rankings are um, a reflection of 247 sports espn and rivals which um before like a couple months ago were the three ma major recruiting services uh and they had all agreed that uh, dante moore was a five-star prospect Essentially, what a five-star prospect is, is they're evaluated as one of the 32 top players in high school football, equivalent to being one of 32 NFL draft picks. So they have him as a 16th player, the number three quarterback. He's behind uh, two quarterbacks, one I'm sure everyone knows, Arch Manning, uh, the son of Cooper Manning, nephew of Peyton and Eli, and then uh, Malachi Nelson, who's committed to uh, Oklahoma. Um, but with... Uh, with more, this is a kid that, as you know, uh, MLK in Detroit is drawing a lot of attention from uh, the Midwest schools, being that he's in, right there in Detroit. 
Um, I know that, you know, this is reflected on 247 sports, but the four schools that he's pretty much most interested in right now are Michigan, Michigan State, Notre Dame, and Penn State. Um, right, you know, basically Big Ten country. The guy's got 27 offers. Um, you know, uh, also 247 sports. They uh, they believe he's going to be a, a potential first round pick. And I know that, you know, no, I, I'm not as familiar with the high school football scene in Detroit as what I was in Cleveland and Toledo. But to my knowledge, MLK won a lot of football games with him as well. So I think, um, you know, a lot of recruiting is on the upside of guys. And I think that teams see a lot of upside with Dante Moore. And that's why he's drawing so so much attention from all these schools. Ohio State's offered him as well. You know, something interesting about recruiting um, as well. So, you know, as you know, a good friend of ours, Dresden, uh, and I, we actually went down to see uh, the number one high school quarterback in the country in uh, the Cleveland area, uh, Drew Aller, who's committed to Penn State. Uh, probably, in my opinion, the greatest football high school football player I've ever seen. I mean, it was so easy just seeing him, you know, throw that football. Uh, and he just made, I mean, effortless one, two plays they would score. Uh, I just, I just want to know because – we did some research, and he's a five-star quarterback as well. And if you look at the last 15 years of guys, quarterbacks who were five-star you know, recruits, only three of them are pro bowlers, were, were pro bowl players in the yeah. NFL. So yeah. I, I was Matthew Stafford was one of them. Cam Newton was the other. And uh, the, the third one escapes me. But uh, I, I'm just wondering, so with this star system, how come a lot of these guys seemingly, these – four or five star athletes, some of them don't even like don't even play in college that much. So what's what's with the star system? That's the million dollar question that is still what I'm trying to figure out as someone that covers recruiting, that you know, a lot of these five stars, they don't really sometimes they don't live up to the expectations when going to the college level. And as a result, they don't end up as first round draft picks. Some do, Uh, Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, you know, two guys that come to mind, you know, right away. But um, I I really don't know. That's something that I have been trying to figure out is why these guys kind of don't pan out. I, I think that one thing that does come to mind is that the jump from high school to the FBS level is just incredibly difficult and I I think that you see a lot of guys have a lot of trouble with it and I I think the the one example right now is Clemson starting quarterback DJ Unga Lungalale um he lit up Notre Dame last year he threw for 425 yards or somewhere around there a couple touchdowns and ever since that game he's taken a lot of steps back and I think that's defenses starting to figure him out um, and, and teams being able to game plan for him. And that was a guy that was a five-star quarterback coming out of, out of California. And now Clemson has completely fallen off the map this season. So I really wish I had an answer as to why some of these guys don't really live up to the hype. Um, I, I, and I just think that the one thing that I can point to is, is that jump that is made from high school to college football. Similarly, the jump that you see with, um, you know, NFL first round picks that sometimes turn into bust because the, the leap from college football to the NFL is so great. And the, and the adjust, the adjustment is so large. That's, that's a very, that's a very interesting take for sure. But maybe, maybe one of those guys will pan out one day and maybe you'll see the Detroit lions, uh, drafting him in a couple of years. Cause uh quarterback situation, not, not very good right now in Detroit, but, uh, well, that's what, I, what? <laughs> let me say that um, Thibodeau from Oregon, the pass rusher, Kayvon, I believe his first name, Thibodeau, uh, he was a five-star guy. I believe he was the number one player in his class. So that's a guy that has panned out so far, but we got to see how we translate to the NFL. I, I, I'd like to get to the draft a little bit later as well, but I, I, I do want to shift gears now to this Browns-Lions matchup uh, on Sunday. And uh, so really we know – at least, you know, the Browns getting destroyed by New England in New England last week, uh, you know, a, a New England team that looks like they're kind of uh, 
back a little bit. You know, they it looks like they found their rhythm with Mac Jones and, and you know some of those guys. You know, just the Patriot way is, is starting to come back a little bit. But um, you know, I just want to know the Lions, of course, tied Pittsburgh sixteen to sixteen. Uh, on Sunday, uh, not, not a really pretty showing offensively, but uh, I, I want to know, do you think, like, especially with Baker Mayfield uh, at quarterback, you know, it seemed like he was a little banged up against New England. Is he, you know, what's 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 the health regarding him, and will, will the Lions see Case Keem at all on Sunday, uh, the backup? Oh, boy, you're asking about Baker Mayfield, who has dominated the airwaves in uh, Cleveland's uh, over the last – couple months, year, the contract extension, there is a lot of questions surrounding Baker Mayfield. Um, He injured his shoulder. Uh, I don't know exactly which week, but he was trying to make a tackle. And on on an interception he threw, actually. And as you know, Noah, Drew Brees is a perfect example of why, as a quarterback, you don't try to tackle, tackle guys. And for some reason these quarterbacks don't get it i understand especially with a guy like baker a complete gamer um and in the moment when you throw an interception obviously you're gonna be frustrated and the quickest way to try to make up for it is try to tackle the defender and prevent him from scoring a touchdown uh so he injured his shoulder then and then he injured his shoulder uh a few a few weeks later that caused further damage to it um uh, on a play where he was sacked and he was in a sling after the game. Uh, he sat out Thursday night football, but now he's wearing a harness. It's his non-throwing shoulder. But I think that what you've seen from him is it's, is it's affected the way um, he's played there. I, I think the offense really hasn't opened up the entire playbook as a result of that shoulder injury. And then Going into last week, he injured his uh, plant foot. So he has plant foot, um, which was uh, causing discomfort. Then he had the shoulder issue. And then he suffered a knee injury, uh, which I believe was uh, diagnosed as a bone bruise, um, a day-to-day type thing. But Baker Mayfield is going to be really, really banged up um, when playing Detroit. And... There are, like I mentioned, there are a lot of questions surrounding Baker Mayfield. But if there is one thing that I know for certain is that you cannot question this guy's toughness. He's one of the toughest guys um, in the entire league, in my opinion. It is impossible to get him off the field. And I think in some light, that has hindered the Browns this year, throwing Baker out there. Uh, as banged up as he is. And you almost have to wonder with the the way he's playing, if Case Keenum is a more logical, um, it's more logical to throw him out there being that he's healthy. Now they started him on Thursday night against the Broncos. He won. Uh, Case Keenum has his limitations. He, he can't really spread the ball downfield the way Baker Mayfield, but he's a master of the offense. Uh, You know what you're going to get with him. And I think that, for some Browns fans, even like me, there's been times during some of these performances with Baker, if you thought that maybe it was necessary to bring Case Keenum in the game. And I think for this Sunday, it's really going to have – it's once again going to be all up to, to what Baker can handle. What What's his um, – his, um, I'm trying to think of the word. Um, essentially his toughness level. And if he, if he can't, you know, sustain it, um, or if he's not playing well, I think they are going to put Case Keenum in, but with Mayfield, like I mentioned, as tough as he is, I think he's going to be rolled out as a starter on Sunday. Sounds like another former Lions quarterback, Matthew Stafford, you know, uh, how tough he was (laughs) staying out there, uh, every, every play. I mean, this guy started for, you know, almost 10 years straight, basically, so uh, we'll, we'll we'll definitely see come Sunday what uh, what happens with Baker for sure. But what's what, going I, on with Stafford, man? <laughs> in L.A., the guys had back to back bad games. No, I know. I don't. I don't understand. I mean, I, I people were texting about that too, and you know something about. And I told the podcast listeners in previous episodes, I don't want po- this podcast to turn into a Stafford love fest. You know, he is on another team now. We talked a little bit about him during the Rams week, but yes, he uh, 
that is interesting how he's starting to struggle. But uh, he, you know, he had a really couple, you know, great start to the season on the, but our defense is starting to figure him out, him and McVay out, you know, there's a lot of pressure on the Rams and, uh, you know, especially with all the guys that they brought in on free agency, just brought in a, another guy uh, by the, uh, the initials of OBJ that we're going to talk about actually just about right now, because uh, there's a lot of drama with OBJ in Cleveland. And that's something that the Lions do not do. They don't do anything with drama. They are drama free. They don't have any players with questionable past or breaking up the locker room and all that because there was a lot of talk what about the Dominic and Sue back in the that, day. That, that was a long time ago. That's this is a whole <laughs> new Lions team now. That that's years ago. But no, so you know, I talked about in the podcast last week how I thought it was a it was a good idea that the Lions did not go for Odell Beckham. And Dan Campbell blatantly said, No, we are not interested in, in Odell. What was the whole you know, situation over there in Cleveland and, and why was he so toxic in the locker room? Oh boy. Odell Beckham Jr. I don't know if he was toxic in the locker room. Um, at least what the Browns beat has said is that by all accounts, he was actually a really good teammate. Um, I think the toxicity comes when he's on the field uh, and his demand for the football, you know, he's one of those guys as a, or he used to be a high caliber receiver. He wants the football. And for whatever reason, uh, this is just like our five star question. This is another case study that I really want to dive into is why has Odell Beckham Jr. not worked with, with the Cleveland Browns when they acquired him, John Dorsey was a general manager, obviously in Detroit right now. Uh, He was exactly what the Browns needed. They had Jarvis Landry, um, and you know, they had David and Joku at tight end who they drafted, um, in the first round, they had a, a really strong run game. Baker Mayfield was phenomenal as a rookie and Baker Mayfield lit it up with Brashad Perryman, who was like an OBJ light. And I think the Browns thinking was, well, if Baker Mayfield can do this with Brashad Perryman, just imagine what he can do with Odell Beckham Jr. Well, I think the first year, Freddie Kitchens was the head coach. That was a guy that was way, way in over his head. So that year was basically a mulligan. Last year, things were not going as well. Um, Odell Beckham Jr. tore his ACL, ironically, on a tackle um, that he was trying to make after a Baker interception against Cincinnati. And then this year, um, he's been recovering from that ACL. He sat out, the, I think, the first two games it was. He returned. But it just it's simply they were not clicking. Uh, Odell Beckham Jr. was not getting the targets um, that that he wanted. Um, and then in that same token, I don't think Odell Beckham Jr. has performed uh, the way top end high level receivers that are paid you know fifteen million dollars are supposed to. You know, with Odell Beckham Jr. making that phenomenal catch on Sunday Night Football. I think in 2014, his rookie season, um, you know, that kind of labeled him as a guy that doesn't drop anything. And I think for a lot of his career in New York, he was a really reliable receiver. In Cleveland, for whatever reason, he had a lot of difficulty catching the football. And the other thing that stuck out about Odell Beckham Jr.'s um, transition from New York to Cleveland is, I remember what OBJ did so well in New York was his run after catch in the middle of the field. It just, he dominated in in between the hashes and and in Cleveland, it seems like a lot of the routes he's running are outside the hashes. Now this is getting a little bit above my expertise, but simply said OBJ was one of the most dangerous slant receivers in the NFL. I don't ever recall the Browns. Well, I do recall a couple instances, but there hardly hasn't been many where the Browns have given them those easy opportunities to create after the catch. So just a culmination of issues, just boiling, boiling up. And, you know, then his dad goes out on uh, social media and posts a, a video that was made by someone else showing all these uh, targets or lack thereof of Baker Mayfield when or of Oda Beckham Jr. was wide open. Baker Mayfield's not throwing on the ball. I don't know why that is. Um, it's above my pay grade, but 
I think the Browns are certainly better off um, with him. They Baker Mayfield objectively plays better without Odell Beckham Jr. The stats are there. Uh, unfortunately, last week is not uh, proof of that by any means, but um, I'm really interested to see what happens with him in L.A. Going to a new offensive mind in Sean McVay, obviously – a talented quarterback with Matthew Stafford that should be able to get him the ball. I and mean, you look at what he did with Calvin Johnson. I don't think Odo Beckham Jr. is Megatron, but, you know, this is a guy that was pro, pro bowler before. He was a really exciting player. So can he get back to that level? And hey, I think it's going to be really interesting to find out and see. Talking with Kyle Kelly, uh, does some work for uh, Cleveland.com with Ohio State Recruiting, also a, a Medill student over at Northwestern. Uh, I, so I, I just want to cut to the chase, basically, for this Sunday. Give me one way that the Browns win this game and one reason that the Lions may be able to get their first win the season. Yeah, um, I think with the Browns, uh, it's all about running the football and winning the turnover battle. I think that's uh, the Browns. When they do those two things, they usually usually win. That's the way the offense is set up, is to go through Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. Now, Nick Chubb didn't play last week. He was on the COVID list. Kareem Hunt's been out with a calf injury. The offense goes through those two guys. And Dearness Johnson's been great, uh, but he didn't really make anything happen besides the opening drive. And uh, last week against New England, I don't know if that's on him or Kevin Stefanski. I tend to go with the latter um, from last week, but I think the Browns need to establish the run and focus on the run game, especially with as ba- banged up as Baker Mayfield is. And I don't really know much about the Lions' run defense, other than I know they don't really have a lot of talent in that front seven, especially uh, at the linebacker position. So maybe an opportunity uh, for the Browns to exploit those weaknesses. And I think that with the level of play that Jared Goff has had uh, this season, I I think that getting an interception or two would be huge for the Browns uh, defense, being able to set up the offense and um, capitalize on those opportunities. For the Lions, oh, no, I, I'm sorry, but, man, they just really aren't a good football team this year. Uh, hey, they hung out, hung around with Pittsburgh, though. I'll give them that. Um, the Steelers' defense is really good, but Mason Ru- Rudolph is not very good. Um, I did not really catch a whole lot of that game other than overtime, which was an absolute disaster. But I think if, if you're, you're the Lions – this should be a game that the Browns should score a lot of points. This offense is is engineered to do so. We've the, the, you've seen the Browns do it in the past. Um, the Chargers game is a great example. Unfortunately, one they lost. But if you're the Lions, you really got to go score for score with the with the Browns because although Bill Cowher said um, heading into Sunday's game that the Browns have a top five defense and. A lot of other people have said that as well. It could be further from the truth. This Browns defense is not good, especially with the way it's playing right now. Uh, Miles Garrett's probably the only guy on that roster that has been consistent from week to week. Denzel Ward has made plays. Greg Newsome has looked really good as a rookie. Same thing with Jeremiah Wusu Koromoa. But other than those guys, you know, there really hasn't been a lot of signs of encouragement on the defensive side of the ball. And if you have Mac Jones, a rookie quarterback with that cast of offensive weapons with Damian Harris out and, you know, those talent at receiver, you know, hanging 45 points on the Browns. I would be interested to see see what the Lions offense can do. I, I don't think it's as high powered as New England's. Obviously, Josh McDaniels, or John Carroll grad is in New England. Um, but I think with the Lions, they've had a lot of success running the ball this year with DeAndre Swift. He's been a, a a big bright spot, but how about getting TJ Hawkins in the football? No catches last week, and um, I think those are are some ways the Lions can beat the Browns this week is is scoring points. And I think they even as bad as that Lions offense is, the Browns defense is not good at either. We'll see if the Lions will be able to run the football 
against uh, against the Browns uh, last week. They put up over 200 yards uh, on the ground total. Swift had over 100 himself, so uh, they definitely uh, had some success last week. But uh, Lions looking for their first victory of the season, of course. One more question for you, Kyle, and I want to revert a little bit back to the draft, as we talked about earlier. You talked about Thetabo. He was a five-star recruit out of high school, really projected number one overall pick right now. Uh, so say the Lions at the end of the season, and I know there's a lot of talk about, you know, there's already talk about next year's draft with the Lions because of how the season's going. If the Lions get the number one overall pick, is this a guy that you take number one overall, or is there, you know, the quarterback position? I know it's a, a big spot for the Lions right now, but I mean, it doesn't seem like there's a ton of big quarterbacks out there. Or you just go defensive lines, a, a pick that Chris Spielman and, um, uh, Brad Holmes and, and Dan Campbell, you know, they love beefing up the guys up front. So I really think that uh, the Lions can take a page out of the Browns book um, from the 2017 and 18 drafts with the way the Browns approached it. Um, in 2017, this is a draft where, um, at least going into it, Nobody thought quarterbacks were worthy of the number one overall pick. Mitch Trubisky actually got a lot of the attention as a potential first overall pick. There were a lot of knocks on Deshaun Watson coming out of that draft, but uh, he's obviously proved people wrong. And then, of course, Patrick Mahomes has been, uh, you know, a slam dunk. And I, you know, I've always held the stance that if Patrick Mahomes goes to Kansas City and if all the stars don't align there, I don't know if he's as good as what he is in Kansas City elsewhere. Um, you know, obviously he's an extremely talented quarterback, but he's he's had a lot go right for him in Kansas City from that aspect. But what the Browns did in that draft is they drafted Miles Garrett number one overall, who ironically was a five star guy, uh, one of the top players in his class. And I think if you're the Lions, you're in a a similar. Uh, you know, similar spot as the Browns. I think that Kayvon Thibodeau is a slam dunk number one overall pick. Um, kind of like Miles Garrett, ironically, both were battling injuries throughout college. Uh, Miles Garrett has really excelled um, in the NFL. He's a defensive player of the year candidate, probably won't win it because the Browns stink. Um, but I think the Browns, or excuse me, the Lions, that's the approach you have to take. The quarterback class this year at least to my knowledge, doesn't really seem like there's a guy that's, um, you know, like a slam dunk number one overall pick. And I think that is was kind of the same way with the 2017 draft. I don't know anything about the quarterbacks uh, for next year's draft, but I think that, you know, with where you're at with the Lions, I think there's an understanding that this team is a couple years away from being a Super Bowl contender. And, you know, as you know, bad as Jared Goff has been at times, you know, I think this is a guy that you can throw out there for one more year um, and probably get you another first overall pick with him in the starting quarterback position. But it's also a guy that's serviceable enough where you can throw him out there and eat up another 16 games. Um, but I think I think if you're Detroit, you know, you have to draft Thibodeau at, at this point unless something changes this college football season with what's left of it and some guy – proves himself as worthy as that number one overall pick. Man, sometimes I just don't understand how Jared Goff was a Pro Bowl player and uh, went to a Super Bowl with the Rams. It's I do. It's unbelievable. Sean you McVay. tell me. Well, I mean, he, so if you look at the – I mean, Jared Goff was a rookie then, but with Jeff Fisher, he was terrible. And I think that, you know, a lot of times I think there's the argument is way more – supported that players make the coach. I think Tom Brady is one of those examples, even though some people don't want to say it. Um, I mean, obviously there's so much there. Bill Belichick gave Brady his chance and everything else. But um, in the case of Jared Goff and Sean McVay, I think that uh, Sean McVay absolutely made Jared Goff. And a lot of things went right in Los Angeles. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it was L.A. because uh, McVay never coached the St. Louis Rams. Um, but with Goff, er, and when McVay first arrived, they had Todd Gurley, who during that time was one of the best running backs in the NFL. And they 
had a lot of that offense go through him and McVay was able to, I think one thing he did really well that I wish the Browns would do well with um, Baker Mayfield is they, in LA, they focused on golf strengths and tried to limit his weaknesses. It tried to, they tried to put Jared Goff in positions where um, he didn't have the opportunity for those weaknesses to be exploited. And I think this is absolutely a situation where the, the coach made the quarterback, and I think you're seeing that in Detroit right now. Anthony Lynn has, uh, you know, Dan Campbell basically took Anthony Lynn's play call privileges away. He was calling all those plays. Uh, and I didn't uh, notice that. Oh, uh, yes, he did. You know, I, I, I saw the playbook in his or the play sheet in his hand. I didn't know Dan Campbell mm-hmm. ever called plays, but he's definitely taken it upon himself. Anthony Lynn, uh, he was spotted in the press box not having a headset on at all. So and it was very it was very clear that uh, and you could see Dan Campbell switching uh, from different headsets, you know, with trying to get in touch with Jared Goff. So it was definitely he was definitely calling the plays and uh, he called enough plays to uh, to tie the Pittsburgh Steelers, I guess even though the Lions haven't won in Pittsburgh since 1955. But I want to thank you again, Kyle, for coming on. Uh, make sure to follow Kyle on Twitter, uh, at by Kyle Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y uh, is his last name. He's He's got a lot of great content about, you know, some Brown stuff, some Ohio State recruiting, uh, and, you know, of course, about uh, all the stuff that he's – great stuff he's doing at Medill uh, as well. But, Kyle, good friend of mine, great to catch up with you, and, and thanks for talking about a little bit about Browns and, and a lot of the other stuff you do. Not a problem. Thanks for having me on, and uh, go Browns. <laughs> and want to thank Kyle for coming on to the show. It was uh, great to have his podcast debut. I was thinking about, it's like, you know, if I really wanted to get a guest this week, and I was thinking, you know, maybe should I try to get maybe a, an, ex, an ex-Brown or maybe a guy who used to play for the Browns and the Lions, but, uh, you know, I just decided, you know, it'd be great to have Kyle on because, uh, you know, he, his, uh, his old Browns expertise from back in the day, covering the team a little bit. I know he's out in Chicago doing some great things now, but like I said, one of my, one of the best, one of the, uh, my best friends and a guy that I really am rooting for to make it big one day. So, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you'll see him on uh, ESPN or something like that one day. We'll, uh, we'll see. I know he's got some, some big goals in mind, but, uh, definitely we've had a, we've had a lot of fun together and a lot of, a lot of great memories. That's for sure. Make sure to tune in to all the other great content on the podcast network the michigan podcast we didn't talk a lot about college football today but uh, i know he'll he'll get you a little bit a little bit deeper of a dive especially you know michigan state playing ohio state this week a huge game for mel tucker uh, and the spartans also uh, the fan report they got a lot of pistons analysis that's a, that's a whole other problem right now in detroit and then of course doc and jock the the classic podcast talking all kinds of awesome sports uh, as well with the wrestling podcast paired up with that as well, and John Magger doing a great job with uh, his his SI Lions uh, coverage, and then uh, Vito Churko and, and company doing a great job with Tigers. Uh, you know, we didn't get to Tigers today, but we're going to be getting that to another day because they're, they're making some moves uh, this off season that I think are very interesting, and, and hopefully, hopefully, this Carlos Correa rumor uh, is true, and, and hopefully, he is coming to Detroit because the the Tigers really need. It's very imperative that the Tigers pick up a guy uh, like like a Carlos Correa. That's for sure. Thanks again, folks, for tuning in. And always go Lions, especially over the Browns. And make sure to tune in next week only on Open Mic Night.